And now their logo is just a picture of a lake with some trees. Yes, <laughs> yes. Boring. <laughs> and how is this more culturally sensitive? You get rid of the Indian, but you keep the land. Yes, yes. It, it would have been uh, less culturally insensitive if they had swapped the uh, lady for Elizabeth Warren on the box. <laughs> it's white butter. <laughs> <laughs> Pistols, prayer, and potluck. This is Armed Lutheran Radio. Hi folks, welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio, a show about guns, hunting, competitive shooting, the natural right of self-defense, and what God's Word says about the issues surrounding gun rights and gun ownership. I am your host, Lloyd Bailey, the Armed Lutheran. And this is episode number 283. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. Welcome to those of you who are new to the show and just stumbled across us, thought you'd check us out. I hope you enjoy today's show. It's a variety show, so you get to hear from members of the entire cast today. Uh, But first, I do want to give a, a big shout out to the people who make this show possible, the members of the Reformation Gun Club. This week, I want to thank... David from Milford, Connecticut, Donnie from White Bear Lake, Minnesota, Eric and George from Junction City, Kansas, uh, Scott, and our two newest members, Guy from Calais, Maine, and Guillaume from Osage Beach, Missouri. Thank you all so much for your support, and thank you to all the members of the Reformation Gun Club. Folks, Armed Lutheran Radio is listener-funded, and that means we don't have any advertising. You're not going to hear ads for HelloFresh on this uh, on this podcast. You're going to uh, this little shout-out to the members of the Reformation Gun Club is as close to an ad as you're going to hear All year, Uh, we rely on the monthly and yearly contributions of the members of the Reformation Gun Club to keep things going. If you would like to join them and help support the show and get some cool benefits at the same time, check out all the information at armedlutheran.us slash gun club or look for a link in the show notes for this or any of our previous episodes. All right. Today, as I said, another variety show with content from the entire cast. For those of you who are new, what that means is you're going to hear different segments with information from our awesome contributors. Uh, But first, I I did want to, something on my mind, I just wanted to um, expound upon to share this morning. Remember, uh, it was a couple of episodes back, maybe three episodes back, we talked about prudent rulers. We talked about Romans 13 and how it tells us to respect the authority of government, which was instituted for our good. Of course, the key component in that sentence is for our good. If government is not for our good, as I said previously, if government is actively harming your neighbor, then we as Christians have a responsibility to resist. And this week, we got another example The Biden administration, remember, I used to call it the Biden-Harris administration, but they've decided, I've decided to just take the Harris part off because what I think the Biden-Harris administration realized is that the Harris part of the administration is grossly unpopular, and the more you put her in front of the cameras, the more people hate it. So um, we've had more press conferences and speeches and announcements where you you just don't see Vice President Harris anymore. So it's all on good old Joe. Well, this past week, the administration changed its policies regarding the distribution of something called monoclonal antibody treatments. This is a treatment for COVID. Previously, states, apparently, as I understand it, states were able to order whatever they needed based on need, based on the number of people who were sick uh, each week. And um, last week, I think it was, I know last week they made a big change. I'm not sure whether they federalized the program. So basically you have to order from uh, or what you get, what each state gets is directly controlled by the federal government now. 
And so this is rationing socialized, essentially socialized health care. And we got our first look at rationing this week when the administration uh, decided that they were going to change their distribution system based on equity and not on need. Now, whenever you hear the word equity, when it comes, especially when it comes to government programs, that's not government for your good. Because what the government is doing is that they're deciding that providing potentially life-saving medical treatment to its citizens should be based on politics, not on actual, the actual medical situation on the ground. Biden has proven himself to be an evil, spiteful, thin-skinned geriatric fool who has now decided he's going to play politics with the lives of people in states governed by Republicans. See, Florida and Texas and other red states who have recently seen a spike in the number of uh, COVID cases are no longer going to receive doses of this antibody treatment because the governments of those states, specifically the governors, oppose the president's anti-science, ham-fisted mandates on masking, on kids wearing masks in schools, and on vaccines. Florida and Texas specifically, uh, which have been following actual science instead of following politics, have decided that forcing elementary school children to wear masks is stupid. And it is. They have openly opposed the government mandates for vaccines, which have proven only to further harden people against getting vaccinated. The Biden administration, when people... Uh, expressed opposition. The Biden administration's response has been to be angry with those people and to try to force people to do what they don't want to do. Instead, in states like Texas, in states like Tennessee and Alabama and Georgia and Florida, the governments have basically said, look, vaccines are available. We encourage you to go get a vaccine but we're not going to force you to do it. We're not going to force you to lose your job. We're not going to make it difficult for you to live your life because you're only harming yourself. And what the Biden administration has done is the exact opposite. We're going to force you to do it whether you want to or not because for some reason they seem to think that they're hurting other people, that somehow the unvaccinated are a threat to the vaccinated, which is, again... Stupid. So as punishment for their outspoken opposition to Biden's policies, which we discussed a couple of weeks ago, the Biden administration has decided to deny medical treatment to people in those states as a way to damage Republican governors and legislatures. In the same way that they played politics with COVID and people's lives in an attempt to oust President Trump, they're now going to do the same thing with governors like Abbott in Texas and DeSantis in Florida. When people died from COVID last year, it was all Trump's fault. Now that people are still dying and Biden's in office, now it's the fault of Republican governors. It's funny how that works. As I've said from the start, the, the, the response to this, as we've talked about for a year and a half, the response from all levels, federal government on down, even when Trump was in office, the response has been purely politics. I've never at once suggested that COVID is a hoax or that COVID is the same as flu. It's not. But what I have been steadfastly opposed to, and we have spoken out about on this program repeatedly, is that this is not a political issue And we shouldn't be using this as a way to control people's lives. But that's exactly what government has done from the local uh, level all the way up to the federal government. They're playing politics with the lives of American citizens. And they don't care if you die as long as they can score political points. This isn't a game. This is just plain evil, what they're doing. Those of you... Those out there, I don't know how many there are who are listening to this, who voted for Joe Biden, thinking that he was going to be, you know, this more thoughtful, more compassionate leader because orange man bad. 
Keep this in mind in November next year in 2022. Good old Joe does not care if you die as long as he can blame your death on his political rivals. That is the textbook definition of a government that is not for your good. All right, enough from me. Time for me to step aside. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Visit our feedback page. If you have questions or comments about this or anything else you're going to hear in just a few minutes, we uh, welcome your comments or your questions at uh, armedlutheran.us slash feedback. Uh, time to turn it over to my off- awesome cast. They, they are, um, we've got them all back together this week. Mia is up first with her, um, uh, with uh, another Mia's motivation. Sergeant Bill is prepping for the IDPA National Championship, uh, which is coming up later this week. And he is talking about uh, those efforts in his Ballistic Minute this, this week. And Pastor John Bennett is back with another pastoral pontification. So sit back, enjoy the show. I'll talk to you again next week. Time now for Mia's Motivations with Mia Einstein. Hey, hi, hello. I'm happy to be chatting with you again. I hope that you're all doing well and that you are sharing some smiles now now and again. Today, I wanted to talk to you about new gun owners or those who are new to handling firearms. A friend of mine tagged me in a post on Instagram the other day, and it was a Wall Street Journal article that was um, based out of San Diego, and they were indicating that women are nearly half of new gun owners or gun buyers. And in that report, they are kind of looking at the time period from January of 2019 until now, and that being September of 2021. But they are showing that there are an estimated 3.5 million women that have become new gun owners in that time period. That is quite a bit of new gun owners. So while we're looking at that statistic or while we're thinking about it, what I wanted to talk to you about is that that is great news. It's great news that people are deciding that they want to take up gun ownership, but I also hope that they are taking some lessons and learning firearm safety and gun handling. I write for Shooting Industry Magazine, and it's something that I always encourage the gun store owners is to encourage new gun buyers to take some type of gun training. But I wanted to tell you about an experience that I had this summer when I was at the range, and I was at an event where it was a bunch of professionals in the outdoor industry, in shooting, hunting, and outdoor sports. And at this event, I was at the range, I was primarily looking to get photos to use in my articles, because that is always a challenge. Writing is one thing, but then coming up with images to submit with articles is another. And as I was taking photos, I noticed one young lady that was having a difficult time with handguns. And this is something that I wanted to talk to you about because it's something that I hope if you're a new gun owner, I hope you'll ask for help. And if you already have firearm, I hope that you will consider how you address somebody that you see needs help. And as I'm taking these pictures, this young lady, she was having a hard time gripping. I could tell right away that she didn't understand But I also was allowing the person who was running the range to instruct and to teach. However, in this situation, we were supposed to all be professionals who it's assumed all have experience. And when we're looking at these situations right away, as a firearm instructor, I'm thinking I need to step in before this new 
gun handler, I don't know if this person owned a gun or not, before this person, it becomes unsafe. And so I stepped in and I could tell that the person running this station appreciated my my help because what was going on was this young lady, she didn't need a drill sergeant. She needed somebody who could directly tell her and demonstrate how to handle the gun, but also she wanted to just give me the gun and have me do it for her. And this is something that I see with parents and children. We don't necessarily need to do it for them. We need to have them do it so then they know what they're doing. Because if we always do things for someone, then they don't know what they're doing when it comes their time and you're not there to do it for them. I hope this is making sense to you. And I mention it because as I said, she was definitely nervous. She was shaking. And this is something at a media event, you have a lot of people eyes are on you. So you do become nervous, even if you're experienced, but there are several handguns there. So I grabbed one and demonstrated. And then here we go again. You also have to know how to approach it with the proper words, but then she was left-handed. So I thankfully have a left-handed daughter. So I was able to swap the gun over into my left hand and run it reverse from my traditional right-hand method. This is something you need to consider because with this young lady being so nervous, when I was trying to show her, you do the opposite of me because you're left-handed, In her probably a million thoughts going through her head, she wasn't grasping what I was showing her. So I was able to just swap that over and show her, okay, hold like this and show her how you put your grip up the back strap, how you wrap your fingers around, how you put your grip over the top of a slide to rack a slide. And this is something that I hope if you see something similar going on at the range, I hope you will step in and I hope that you can strategically speak directly. Maybe you will need to be a drill sergeant. This situation didn't require that, but I have had that in my hunter ed classes where I have had to become the drill sergeant that says, hey, you do this or you do not pass. And so we have to assess the situation, but then swiftly step in and demonstrate so that you can help somebody become more confident and keep them safe and teach them skills that they can use when they are progressing on in their firearms experience. So I hope that you will consider that if you have scenarios that you've experienced, let us know over in the Reformation Gun Club. I am always interested in knowing others experiences or watching and seeing other people handle things how they speak because when we observe, we can learn. And when we interact, we can learn as well. So I hope that you can share some firearm safety with others and that you will have a great week. Talk to you next time. Bye guys. You can read more from Mia, watch her YouTube videos, or check out her podcast, Mac Outdoors with Mia and Leah at miaanstein.com. Time now for another Ballistic Minute with Sergeant Bill Sylvia. Hey everybody, I'm Sergeant Bill. This is your Ballistic Minute. Today I want to talk to you about something we've talked about before, big match prep. So for most shooters, IDPA Nationals 2021 is about two weeks away. And if you're going, you need to be prepared. Now I'm not going to be going to IDPA Nationals this year for the first time in four or five years, I guess mostly due to ammo and other different reasons, but I know a lot of shooters that are gonna be going, so just wanna talk to you about being prepared for it. So if you're going to nationals, or if you're just shooting a big match, you need to be prepared for it. You need to, at least a couple weeks out, if you can do live fire practice sessions, you need to make your practice sessions harder. Use longer shots, make more hard cover, use more non-threats, even do standards with you know your strong hand only, weak hand only shooting and do them at further distances because big matches and especially IDPA nationals or worlds are gonna ramp up the difficulty because they should. So to get yourself prepared for the more difficult stages, you need to up that difficulty in your practice sessions. 
but on your last practice session or last two maybe, you should actually have an easy practice session where you can just build your confidence and really get yourself ready to go. You've already done the hard work. The last couple practice sessions, Live Fire, should be just building and boosting your confidence. Now you also need to double check all of your gear. Take your gun apart, clean it thoroughly before you go to your big match. I'd actually shoot it one of your last practice sessions just to make sure it's all going well. Check your springs and your parts, make sure everything's good to go. If you have a backup gun, do the same thing with that one. Also, take your holster and your mag pouches and double check the Loctite on the screws. Make sure that they're tightened down the way you want them, your retention's the way you want them, and put some more Loctite on them. Just make sure they're good to go. You're not gonna have any problems with that. Then your mags, clean them. And then when you're done, if you're shooting metal mags, take some clear car wax and wax those mags. It'll help keep the dust and dirt off of them. It will help them to eject out of the gun a little easier. And if you're using plastic mags for like a Glock, put some armor all on a rag, wipe the rag with the armor all onto the mag, let it sit for a minute, and then wipe it dry. And it'll do the exact same thing. The magazines will work better. They'll repel the dirt and dust, and they'll be easier to keep clean while you're shooting those matches. I'd also take all my match ammo and I would re case gauge them just so you have that out of your head that you're going to have any problems with any ammo take your time with it make sure that if you're using reloaded ammo that your reloads are perfect and good to go last but not least make a packing checklist of all the things you're going to need for the match to include all your guns and gear and ammo any niceties you might bring if you use any um grip solvent type stuff on your hands, uh, drinks or snacks or any of the things, face towel, sunblock, any of the things you might need, make a check checklist of everything so that you won't forget anything. And then you'll have that confidence going in the match that you have everything you need, you're completely prepared, and you could just shoot. Shoot well, have fun, and do your best. I'm Sergeant Bill, this has been your Ballistic Minute. Sergeant Bill Sylvia is a veteran of the Dallas Police Force and a masterclass competitive shooter. You can check out his YouTube videos at armedlutheran.us slash Sergeant Bill. It's time for Pastoral Pontifications with Pastor John Bennett. This is the Pistol Packing Padre, Pastor John Bennett, and you're listening to another segment of Pastoral Pontifications. We hear a lot from conservative pundits about the culture war in America. And if you're even mildly observant of the present conditions in our country, it's almost impossible not to see it. Whether it's the insanity of pushing transgender ideology on our children, drag queen story hour, critical race theory, or any of the other examples of the insanity that's taking place in our country, these are all facets of a multi-fronted culture war aimed at destroying our personal liberties, most notably the rights guaranteed in the Constitution to freedom of speech, the free exercise of religion, the right to keep and bear arms, and so forth. Though this isn't a traditional war with each side aiming lethal weapons at one another, unless you happen to be an unborn child in your mother's womb as she's visiting a Planned Parenthood facility, this is a war of two opposing ideologies with very real consequences. In reflecting on this culture war, there's an aspect that is often overlooked, one that is perhaps the most foundational and fundamental, and that is the attack on the family. So often we focus on the more obvious assault on our liberty. But what is so satanically subtle is how the constant attack to destroy the family is in many ways the greatest threat to our freedom yet so often it goes unnoticed. Think about it for a moment. Going back to the Marxist revolutions that swept through Russia, China, Cuba, and other such strongholds of communist ideology, there has always been a common goal to replace parents with the state. The same was true for Nazi Germany, where the youth programs eventually led to children proudly reporting their parents to the authorities if mom and dad just happened to step out of line regarding the party philosophy. 
The school makes a whole lot of sense when you think about it. It's much easier to maintain control of millions of people, or in China's case, more than one billion people. It's easier to control the masses if children are indoctrinated to owe greater allegiance to the state than to their parents. We see how this has trickled into American life over the past century. Many of the welfare programs that were introduced by FDR in his New Deal and later expanded by LBJ in his Great Society reforms were designed to create greater dependency on the federal government. Just one simple example, the rate of unwed mothers skyrocketed after the introduction of these programs, specifically among African Americans after LBJ's Great Society reforms. And there seems to be this natural tendency in people to be loyal to those who give them money. We also see how over the last 50 years or so, that Marxist ideology has continued to be gradually overtaking the education system in our country. And this has led to many young people to believe that the government is the solution to all of society's problems, rather than often the cause of these problems. We've seen, especially in the past year and a half, of how many educators have taken off their mask and revealed the truth that many who were paying attention knew already. That not all, but far too many educators in this country believe that they, the educators, should control everything that children are taught and that they are the ones who should have the primary responsibility of indoctrinating children. And so often the result of this is them impressing the radical Marxist ideology on the next generation. In a way, you could say that this cultural war is a battle for the soul of our children. What I'm getting at here is that if we're going to survive this culture war, we need to get back to strengthening that foundation of the family. Allow me to get straight to the point. In order to survive this war, we need to have healthy families. Now, I realize that if I had started with this point, I might have lost some of you, but by now, hopefully... I've gotten your attention enough that you'll stick with me through this. The basic foundation of civilization is the family, and the foundation of the family is marriage. Now, I get that for some of you this may be a touchy subject, because I'm sure some of our listeners have endured the pain of divorce, whether it was with your own marriage or it was the marriage of your parents. Of course, there's nothing that can be done to retroactively neutralize the pain that was generated from the circumstances that resulted in divorce. But moving forward, we need healthy families and healthy marriages. And here's why. Now, aside from the obvious that both marriage and children are a gift from God, there's a very practical aspect that demonstrates the importance of having strong families and strong marriages. The end result of this culture war depends much on the next generation. It's going to depend on our children and our grandchildren whether or not we'd like to admit it. They are inheriting a very broken world, and it is important that they be strengthened and prepared to survive it without being consumed by the cultural Marxism that has so thoroughly permeated our society. It is my belief that the best way that we can do this is through mothers and fathers setting healthy examples for their children to follow. What makes this so hard is that we live in a very selfish society. I've sadly seen many marriages fail, and so often the cause is selfishness on the part of one or both spouses. If husband and wife are focused primarily on their personal wants and needs, so often the wants and needs of their spouse are ignored. Marriage needs to be built on a foundation of Christ and selfless love. If I'm focused primarily on fulfilling the needs of my wife and pursuing her happiness, and likewise, She's focused on my needs and my happiness. The joy of our marriage is multiplied. If, however, our spouse comes second, the marriage becomes a breeding ground for resentment. And unfortunately, this is something that wears off on the children as well. Now, I know that none of you came here for relationship advice, but please bear with me for just a bit while I touch on a few key points regarding marriage and the family. First, Date your spouse. Now, men, we can be the biggest culprit on this one. There seems to be this tendency that once the honeymoon period has worn off, that men simply stop trying. Treat your wife every day like you're trying to get her to fall in love with you all over again. And ladies, if your husband is making that effort, be sure to let him know that you've noticed. Second, worship with your spouse. 
A study a few years ago from the Pew Research Center showed that couples that worshipped regularly together had a significantly lower rate of divorce. And if you think about it, the reason is pretty simple. If husband and wife are reminded together of the love and forgiveness that our Savior has for them, it's easier for husband and wife to forgive one another and to continue loving one another even when conflict has arisen in the marriage. And the third point, and this will be the last point regarding relationship advice, some words of wisdom from Martin Luther. He writes, and this is one of my favorite quotes from Luther, Let the wife make the husband glad to come home, and let him make her sorry to see him leave. In other words, treat one another with selfless love. Now, the point of all this is that children are better served by mother and father living together in a healthy home environment. And if our children are going to be engaged in fighting this cultural war, we want them to be as strong as possible. While this is ideal, this isn't to say that strong children can't come from broken homes. Some of you listening are proof of that. My wife is proof of that. I'm sure some of you are divorced and doing a fantastic job of raising your children to be strong and ready to face the challenges of living in a fallen creation. Now, as a side note, just because mom and dad are still together doesn't mean that the children are being raised in a healthy environment either. I'm a perfect example of this. I grew up in an abusive household, and even those emotional scars are still there. I've survived, and I'm doing everything that I can to make sure that my children never know what it's like to be abused. So if this describes you, do everything you can to break that cycle. The point is that there are so many factors that can affect our children, and it is so vitally important that we do everything we can to prepare and equip our children for the hostile world that they're going to be living in as adults. One way to do this is to exemplify healthy relationships for them as parents, or grandparents, or aunts and uncles, and so forth. Whatever circumstances you find yourself in, be sure to do all you can to raise up this next generation as strong defenders of liberty. For as the culture war continues, not only are you and I going to be fighting alongside one another, but eventually, our children are going to be fighting by our side as well. Well, that is all for this time. If you have any questions or comments, if you have any criticisms, I'd be happy to deal with that as well. If you have anything that you would like me to contemplate on, to pontificate for you, you can send any suggestions to the feedback page at armlutheran.us. John Bennett is the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in Willow Creek, Minnesota. For more information, visit stjohnswillowcreek.org. For show notes, be sure to visit our website at www.armedlutheran.us. Check out the Facebook page, The Armed Lutheran, or join our Facebook group, Fans of Armed Lutheran Radio. If you like what you hear, please leave us a comment on our feedback page at armedlutheran.us slash feedback or a review on iTunes, and let us know what you think. Thank you for listening to Armed Lutheran Radio, a member of the Self-Defense Radio Network.